Johnny knows now is OG. The story is trending around the world. Hello, OG. <laughs> Good morning, Dr. Abati. How are you? How was your weekend? It was fantastic. How was yours? Yeah, yeah. I watched you over the weekend. You were okay. excellent. Thank you. Good morning, Tundun. Morning, How are you? RG. I'm great. Thank Perfect. you. Perfect. Yeah. I'm doing well. Good morning, Rufai. How are you? <laughs> All right. We dash you. You've taken over from Dr. Abati right now. <laughs> Well, good morning to you, viewers. We begin what's trending in Ghana, where a Nigerian high commission building in the country was demolished over the weekend by an unknown man who claimed the building was on his property. Well, let's take a look at this video before we come back for a discussion. Nigeria life matter in Ghana. We are human beings. We can breathe. We are on our way. If this thing can be done for our high commission resident, this is Nigeria overnight. Overnight, the human life is in danger. The human life is in danger all over the world. America, Europe, our high commission life is in danger. Well, the Nigerian Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Jeffrey Oyema, has responded. On Twitter, he wrote, We're engaging the Ghanaian government and demand urgent action to find the perpetrators and provide adequate protection for Nigerians and their property in Ghana. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Ghana also released a press statement admitting that the incident was a breach of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations and reassured the Nigerian High Commission that the Ghanaian government will not relent on its primary obligation to guarantee the safety of all. I, mean, I think it's a sacrilege. <laughs> it's terrible. I completely agree with the outrage that those people are expressing. This is not the done thing. Taking bulldozers in the middle of the night, we had a similar incident, didn't we, recently in Quara. It's never a good sign. It goes to show some kind of illegality, you know, is at foot. If you really have a legitimate leg to That's stand on... That's what I wanted on, to ask you, yeah, yes. If you have a leg to stand on, a court will order a particular course of action. You cannot go on your own and demolish buildings. Even, even, if you, even if it's your buildings. property. No, you can't. You can't. You can't. Uh, it has to be court ordered. Very this good. is clearly a case of... Uh, a resort to self-help. Yes. And it is good that the Ghanaian authorities have said this is not an act of aggression by the government of Ghana against Nigerian territory. Because the import of Article 22 of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations is that a diplomatic uh, space, uh, even if it's in your country, is inviolable. And that was why, you know, during the uh, June 12 uh, struggle, for example, Persons who were being harassed by the state sought refuge in some embassies. And once they went to that embassy, the Nigerian yes. government automatically backed off. So I, that I, I, now I say, well, it's not the government of Ghana. And I think that clarification is quite reassuring. And we hope that the Ghanaian authorities will investigate this and bring whoever did this to book, uh, whoever resorted to self-help. As uh, Tundo pointed out, if you are aggrieved in any way, whether it's... Uh, embassy or any other property, uh, the right thing to do is to go to court. Exactly. But that has not been done in this case. Now, I'd like to draw attention to something else. The first is, whereas, you know, Nigeria has good relations with countries across the world, bilateral relations, there has been an omission. There has been, you know, an area of concern in terms of person-to-person -person diplomacy. Once upon a, t a time in this continent, in Africa, Nigeria was regarded as the giant. Nobody will have done this kind of thing to Nigeria, say, about, uh, you know, two decades ago, to go and carry a, a bulldozer, to go and demolish, you know, uh, Nigerian, uh, a property on, uh, within the premises of the Nigerian embassy. I agree embassy. with Tundu's word. It is but, but we have seen Shocking. in uh, Guinea-Bissau, in South Africa, in other parts of, uh, you know, Africa, this abiding, growing contempt for anything Nigerian. And I think it's something that, you know, our government needs to worry about. So that apart from bilateral relations, government to government uh, relations, what they call G2G, mm -hmm. there should also be effort to, 
uh, develop better relationship between the Nigerian community uh, in uh, other countries and the people of uh, those countries. I'm very proud of those Nigerian protesters who brought this to yeah, limelight. Why it is Let's, important yes. is that, look, you've seen Nigerians in Ghana now mm. uh, protesting, defending yes. Nigerian uh, property. Now, that could ge degenerate into conflict, violence, between Nigerians resident in Ghana and, and so, Ghanaians. Yes, and More so, as we've been having issues with the Ghanaian Trade Association Correct. that have been harassing and targeting Nigerians doing business yes. in Ghana. Correct. Mm -hmm. Investigations are on the way at this point, and I'm glad that they have said that they are putting, beefing up security to um, protect Nigerian lives. I know you have a comment, Rufai. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Oji. Uh, the, the truth about this relationship between Nigeria and Ghana is it, it has come a long way, and we need to be very, very careful we were there for the Ghanaians in the 70s when the economy was in tatters. They came here. But also, when I interact with Ghanaians, a lot of the things they say is about what happened in 82, 83, Ghana must go saga. But we need to bury that hatchet, and we need to move on. That economic situation, that particular situation has passed, and we need to come together. Because we are neighbors, because we share a lot with Ghana as a country. But... Uh, pervasively, I think this is only happening in Ghana. If you go to Kenya, Nigerians are adored in Kenya. I remember I was once in Kenya, I told somebody I was a Nigerian and I work on the radio in Nigeria. Started taking me to all the friends and say, see a Nigerian journalist. Mm -hmm. And that's how Nigerians are celebrated in, in, in other parts. I mean, in Kenya, they watch our movies. I, I say I watch more Nollywood movies when I was in Kenya than even when I'm in Nigeria. That's to show you. Uh, but we need to really work on that relationship between Nigeria and Ghana. And it goes back to that Ghana must go saga. It does not something. go back to Ghana must go saga. I really hate it when people say that, Rufai. No offense to you, but it goes to the 60s. Kofi Busia, their political leader in Ghana, had Nigeria must go and expelled thousands of Nigerians in the 60s. Why doesn't anybody talk about that? They fired the first that, that, volley. That, that, that's great, Tundu. That's great. But even after Kofi Busia had his own uh, incident, don't forget that we still took the Ghanaians in in that brotherliness and friendship when the economy was running out. So amok. my thing they is, were, why does they everybody were, cite they were, they Ghana were must go? No, no. Uh, why? Tundu, hang on a minute. I was citing that on talking to Ghanaians, what a lot of well, Ghanaians you correct came. them. I no, don't understand no, self-victimization. No, hang on a minute. They started uh, it. No, I'm not going to hang on. Let to, me finish to, my point. To, they started it. And said, why don't you let me speak? They started it in the 60s. Nigerians are so quick to accept blame for what is not our fault. They started it in the 60s. And everybody right. goes on about Ghana right. must go in the 80s and we're quiet. Okay. No. Right. Tono, Tono Rufai, let's move on. Uh, yes. yeah. let's, yeah. Shall we take another story now? Yes, please. In Ogun State, Nigeria, a video recording by a lady who was assaulted by the state's task force agent has gone viral. In the video, the lady stated that her vehicle was impounded because she flouted at the lockdown curfew in the state, but was, however, willing to pay for her vehicle to be released. What happened after she decided to record the gentleman handling her case turned out unpleasant. Let's take a look. Good afternoon, Nigeria. I am in the test local government office. Let me edge your side. Local government office. Of the state. I will do it. I will pay you your 15000 But I will popularize your face. I'm going to do it. We were going to drink. Jesus, do you see this man beating me? Do you see him? The Nigerians, do you see him beating me? Do you see him? Show me your face. Domestic violence, show me your face. Yes, I know me. Where, where are you running to? Why are you hiding? Where, where are you running to? Look at the face of the man beating me. Of Look at the face of the man beating me. Look at the face of the man beating me. An officer of the Ogun State government. We were going to just try to buy something for my daughter. Whose birthday is coming up in the next two weeks? And they caught us and said that we should come to the office. We will pay a fine of 15,000 because there's a total lockdown in Ogun State. They have told them to puncture my tires, and this is the face of the man beating me with all that is going on. 
I wanted to highlight this particular story. This man must be arrested and charged for assault. I mean, there is evidence right there. This yes. is horrendous at this point. How dare you insult a lady, assault a lady like that? He pushed her and then used the car on her video as well. What was the purpose of that? Apparently, her husband was there as well. I'm just completely stunned yes, by know. that. And the fact that she was even filming him yes. and he continued Had means he just has this impunity. He's really defying her. That yes. what, what can you do? Yes. You're right. He should be fired for that. Correct. Well, this happened at, uh, around, uh, I think, the Ujudua Biodun area, mm -hmm. in yes. the for local government uh, area of uh, Ogun State, which is the biggest political constituency uh, in Ogun State. And this uh, gentleman, uh, who, who I think uh, Simplicita is guilty of assault, uh, an harassment has been arrested, according to the uh, transition chairman in that local government, one Must honorable for last salami. So we hope that it will be charged yes. to court. Uh, uh, but at the root of this, of course, is misogyny. You know, this belief that you can assault a woman. Good so there is a gender-based violence I dimension to it that is uh, totally unacceptable. And under the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act, uh, then, of course, it can be charged. Then, again, uh, what we also know is that other officials who were there, you know, who did not try to uh, address the situation, they too have also been uh, suspended from work. But the challenge that you have here is that local governments, in an attempt to meet, you know, their revenue uh, projections, they recruit tax forces to help, you know, arrest people, check uh, paper documents, you know, the, the problem with the multiplication of agencies and uh, over taxation of hapless Nigerians. So this particular task force, they have been given a target and they tend to overreach themselves. I hope that the chairman of it for local government will take a second look at what the task force in that particular local government is doing so that we don't keep having this kind of uh, Situation. Completely unacceptable. Why were they even deflating her tires? Like, I don't even understand. Barrick. Rufai. Uh, there are better ways to approach things, and this that these officials have done is totally, totally inconceivable. There are better ways to approach things. You don't beat up a woman. You have no right. You should be charged for that. Absolutely. It should be charged for that. There are better ways to, even if you are trying to implement something. Uh, you, th there's a way you can, you can tell the woman you violated the law, if she's violated the law. And the shocking part of it is, Dr. Bat, you're talking about the local government. Does this money really go back to the local government, or these guys use the money to just buy drinks in the night and well, eat suya? I think this guy works for a consultancy well, agency. Okay. The local government, Honorable Salami, yes. the uh, chairman, engage consultants. So the consultants are supposed so, to meet certain revenue so projections. Certain revenue projections. And I'm, I'm even more shocked that this is a consultancy agency that this man represents. Yes. It speaks volumes about the consultancy. Very well said, Rufai. Let's take another story. A video of a young street hawker with the most amazing vocals has caught the attention of the governor of Imo State, Hope Uzodimma, who announced that he will adopt and sponsor the young boy. Nine-year-old Joseph Olumachi Opara went viral over the weekend after a video of him singing Catholic hymns circulated on social media. Let's take a listen to this young talent. <laughs> This is so beautiful when I watched over the weekend. Another senator representing Anambra, North Stella Odua, actually made this video viral. She posted him on Instagram and, uh, I mean, on Twitter, and offered him a scholarship as well and music classes. Completely amazing. <laughs> I think you are actually converting me onto the uses of social media. Yes, you I actually should just go thought it was on quite it. pointless. No, it but this it. is it's Twitter things like this is. that it makes it so powerful. Yes. That's amazing. I'm happy for him.
Well, I mean, it's good to see that, uh, you know, there are Nigerians who still recognize talent and would like to encourage talent. Yes. And, of course, the good thing about Nigeria is that whatever problems we may have, this is a country whose major advantage yes. is his human resource yes. at every level. And this is just a young man with such beautiful voice. His ambition, Joseph Opara, his ambition, we're told, is to become uh, a reverend father, yes. a Catholic uh, yes. priest. And I see some people on social media who say, oh, <laughs> you should do something uh, different. But, of course, you know, he has his ambition, and you could see uh, that uh, area that he was singing, uh, you know, sounded like something from the... Uh, Catholic Church. Apart from uh, Senator Odua, I saw on social media also Femi Fani Kaode yeah. uh, volunteering to provide support. And then you also have uh, Hope is Odinma, the governor yeah. of his state, uh, supporting him. But the thing to do, in a wider perspective, is that every Nigerian child should be given opportunity Absolutely. to realize their potentials to the fullest. Uh, it's not all of them that we have an opportunity to demonstrate some kind of talent. But there is innate talent in every Nigerian child, I believe. Very good. Well, let's take another story in Nigeria. I like now it is... that. Oh, great. <laughs> Rafai, go ahead, please. Beautiful. <laughs> A very beautiful sight to behold. Beautiful voice. And like Dr. Bati said, I just hope we can nurture every Nigerian child to truly, truly achieve uh, what they have in them. One person who I like to tag in that tweet for the music singing lessons is Professor Laze Kweme, uh, the first professor of music in Nigeria, a conductor uh, extraordinaire, great man, great insight, and I know he's really going to be passionate about grooming talents like this. All right, perfect. Very well said, Rufai. Let's take another story in Nigeria. Now, it's no news that the federal government officially expunged history from its basic school curriculum in 2007 and relegated it as an elective instead of a core subject at senior secondary level. Now, the director of a new documentary titled The Biafran War Story is set to deliver a message about the Nigerian Civil War, which is perhaps the single most significant event in Nigerian history. Let's take a look. With the second highest death toll, of all African conflicts, the Nigerian Civil War, also known as the Biafran War, is perhaps the single most significant event in Nigerian history. This three-year conflict, which raged on from the 6th of July 1967 till the 15th of January 1970, would claim the lives of over 100,000 soldiers and an estimated 2 million civilians as the Nigerian government led by General Yakubu Gowon fought to prevent the secession of the self-proclaimed Republic of Biafra which was led by General Chukwemeka Odumegu Ojuku. To fully understand the root cause of this brutal conflict, we need to go all the way back to the very beginning. Upon gaining independence from Great Britain in 1960, the newly formed Nigerian Republic was greatly divided as its three largest ethnic groups struggled to live in harmony. Beyond the more obvious distinctions like language, clothing, and marriage customs, Nigeria's three main ethnic groups also had fundamental differences in values and worldviews, which had been developed over the many centuries leading up to the colonial era and the formation of the Nigerian state. This is absolutely brilliant. I can't wait to watch the documentary. It's a 50-minute documentary streaming on OGV uh, Media at this point. OVG. I mean, oh, no, no, OVG, OVG. Me, OVG Media, correct. And I know that you interviewed one of the, the owner of the uh, streaming platform, Ms. Kenan Obaigbena, um, last week. But I'm very particular about the story because of the history that it provides, the fact that, you know, there was no history for several years in, as a core subject in the secondary school level. And this, the story of the Biafra uh, war has been almost like non-existent at this point. I'm really excited that this uh, documentary is uh, coming into flourishion at this point. I think that was deliberate. Yes. I think there's a lot of shame about the Biafra war. Yes. And I don't see the point of shame. It's unhelpful. Everybody needs to just come out with the full story, all perspectives, all right. sides should be heard. And I like the fact that with this documentary, it goes back to the genesis. It's important to put things in their proper perspective. There's no need for shame. We just need to learn the truth and we move forward, hopefully. And most importantly, never repeated. It's when yes. you don't know your own history absolutely. that you're just liable to believe absolutely anything. So it's important to know and be informed. Right. Well, apart from the slave trade, the uh, civil war, the three-year fratricidal war that uh, Nigeria fought between 1967 to seven, 1970, 
is perhaps uh, you know the most devastating thing that ever happened uh, within our space. And it's a story that has been told in visual arts, in literature, in poetry, but it's a story that needs to be told again and again. Yes. And, you know, the more we tell that story, the more we confront ourselves, uh, whatever the medium, with the horror of that experience. And even more importantly, with the need for Nigeria to move beyond that terrible experience, post-colonial experience. Because there are many uh, commentators who believe, who are convinced, that indeed the Nigerian civil war has not ended. And that is why that. Ibos, yeah. many Igbos are still saying, look, the Biafran dream is something they must return to. Because years after the, uh, the uh, civil war, uh, Nigeria has not offered them you know, uh, what uh, uh, they expect, what they deserve. And that the issues of equity, justice, you know, uh, at the heart of the Nigerian question have not been addressed. And a documentary like this will help us to refocus on those key issues. That's when we'll be gaining from the narrative that needs to be uh, promoted. Very good. Rufai, I know you have a comment. I mean, uh, there, there are many accounts of the Biafran story, and, and like uh, Tundu said, if, if we don't understand our history, uh, then how do we even forge our hair? There are many accounts of the Biafran story. Uh, there's the Frederick Forsyth's account on the Mecca. There's Philip F. Young's account. Uh, but for me, what, what I wish, you might call it wishful thinking, uh, the accounts I would love to hear are the accounts of people that never made it to tell the story. You know, the likes of Kaduna Nzego, uh, the likes of Victor Banjo, and other accounts. So if we, in telling the robustness of this uh, Biafran story, if we can go to the families of those that participated, maybe that died, that we can get their memoirs. Well, there's uh, an existing book by uh, yeah. Banjo that okay. was published by his uh, daughter. Oh, great. And uh, on his ogo, um, some people have a manuscript that he purportedly wrote. Oh, great. Uh, but that has not been uh, published. Great, great, great. And the likes of um, Adaka Boro, too, that fought in the war, Isaac Adaka Boro, if we can get these people's insights. And the living generals that are alive that have not given us a memoir. Some people still owe us memoirs about Nigeria's history and Nigeria's development. I still look very fondly to the likes of Oladi Kwadia writing a memoir, Ibrahim Babangida writing a memoir, and a couple of other people. So we can have a more rounded story and we can move on from there. We've all made mistakes in the past, but how we can move on and have a veritable future is what matters the most. Very well said, Rufai. Well, let's head over to the U.S., where President Donald Trump has come under intense criticism for using what many see as racist language to describe COVID-19 during his Tulsa rally in Oklahoma over the weekend. Let's take a listen to what he had to say. Question has more names than any disease in history. I can name Kung Flu. I can name... 19 different versions of name. Many call it a virus, which it is. Many call it a flu. What difference? I think we have 19 or 20 versions of the name. The rally, despite nearly 120,000 American COVID-19 fatalities, the president announced that he has instructed his administration to slow down COVID-19 testing because when there is more testing, there will be more cases. Let's take a look. When you do testing to that extent, you're going to find more people, you're going to find more cases. So I said to my people, slow the testing down, please. They test and they test. We got tests that people don't know what's going on. We got tests. We got another one over here. The young man's 10 years old. He's got the sniffles. He'll recover in about 15 minutes. That's a case. Add up to it. That's a case. That's a case. This is quite embarrassing. The sheer desperation. I'm so embarrassed for President Donald Trump at this point. Why? Why did he have to make that statement? I don't even know where to begin. He's established himself as the king of pejoratives. Yes. When they have a racial undertone, even better. Kung flu, Kung really? Flu that is insane. offensive. And how Kung he's flu. minimizing the 
the casualties of coronavirus, the people who are genuinely suffering, talking about a 10-year-old with the sniffles who will be gone in 15 minutes, but it counts as a case. Unbelievable. It's, it's, it's so Stop wrong. Stop testing. It's I mean... so wrong. <laughs> but now they're saying he was joking. No, it's not of a joke. Of course he wasn't always, joking. Always, always President Trump will do anything, will say anything yes. uh, to seek a re-election. Don't Absolutely. forget that he was making a political statement, uh, even if uh, what he was saying was incorrect, and he was trying to use your uh, expression you know, trying to energize his uh, political base. Yes. And this again confirms what John Bolton, uh, you know, uh, says in his book, The Room Where It Happened, yes. uh, which is uh, coming out tomorrow, uh, that uh, President Trump is just desperate <laughs> and he will do anything Absolutely. or say anything. John Bolton's right. Well, thank you guys. Thank you so much for what's running today. Thank you, Ajit.